Welcome to technology, to leveraging technology in education. I want to talk to you about how to use technology to add value. Now, what, let's first look at what is technology in education, what it is doing and how that's likely to affect us. I want you to click on the first link in the description, which is a, uh, is a TED talk by Dr. Sugata Mitra. Um, which he calls the future of education. It's an absolutely mind-blowing clip. When I, I've been I've been listening to Sugata Mitra for many years now. Um, the first of the experiments that he mentioned in this uh, video, I want you to please watch the whole video. It's about 15 minutes or so. Uh, please stay, please listen to the whole thing. Uh, the first uh, thing which he mentions, he calls it the hole in the wall experiment. Uh, in short, what he did was that. In a Delhi slum, which was next to his office, uh, he put uh, there was a wall in which there was a hole, and he put he stuck a, a PC, a computer, into that uh, with a touchpad on the other side and a high-speed internet connection. Who had access to that uh, PC? Slum children who did not know English, who had never seen a computer in their lives, who had never used the internet. They had no idea what the internet was. They had never seen a uh, touchpad, they had no clue about anything to do with using of that in, of that experiment. Now, as you will see from the video, Dr. Sugata Mitra says, I stuck this thing in the wall. I went across, uh, he says a few kids gathered and they asked me, uh, what is it? So I told them this is a computer. Uh, they said, uh, what can we do with it? They said, whatever you like, uh, you know, try it out. Uh, they said, how does it work? Uh, and remember, all this conversation is happening in Hindi. Uh, they don't know English. Uh, so, uh, he said, he said, I have no idea. How does it work? I said, I have no idea. And uh, he walked away. So, now we have a situation where you have technology. You have this computer. Uh, it can do whatever it can do. Uh, it has a high-speed internet connection. Uh, but on the other side, users, you have slum children uh, who don't have English who have never seen a computer in their lives, they have no idea how to use it. You've already watched the video, but if you hadn't, before you watched the video, if I described this situation to you, and I said to you, tell me, how long do you think it will take for those children to learn how to use the computer? What would you have said? You know how long it actually took? Six hours. That's it. In six hours, those slum children who had no English, and the computer interface is all English, um, who had no idea, who had never seen a computer in their lives, they had no idea how to use a computer, were operating that computer, they were surfing the net, and what's more, they were teaching each other how to use it. There's a beautiful shot there of this six-year-old girl being taught by her older brother of how, on how to use this computer. Um, therefore, my question, very simple is, um, why do we need teachers? And the short answer is, we don't need teachers. We do not need teachers. We don't. Not to teach the way we teach today. So the first and foremost thing that I want you to understand about technology and leveraging technology, leveraging technology is that technology is life-threatening if you don't know what it can do and if you don't know how to use it. Thanks to technology today, all entry barriers to learning have disappeared. We do not need teachers because we can teach ourselves. There are any number of courses on the net today of uh, enabling us to learn about practically every subject on the face of the earth without any teachers. It's the course is available. It's for us to take languages, take uh, technology courses, take anything you want. It's available on the net. All it requires is for me to know how to read and write and that's it. And even if I don't know how to read and write, for example, learning a new language, I don't know how to read and write that language, I can also teach myself to read and write because it's all available on the net and it is free. There's no enrollment, <clears throat> there's no process, there's no traveling. I can sit in my own bedroom and I can learn whatever I want to learn on my computer. Therefore, why do I need teachers? Answer, I don't. I do not need teachers to teach me what they have taught traditionally. <clears throat> I'm quoting for you from an Oxford University study which says that 47% of jobs are at risk 
of being automated in the next 20 years. I submit to you that I consider this study to be a little bit backwards. Uh, it is not 20 years. More than likely, it is 10 years. And a lot of those jobs are going to get automated in the next five years. Practically, what will get automated? Almost anything which is repetitive, almost anything which is mechanical will get automated. In short, if a thing can be done by a machine, it will be done by a machine. Take, for example, this uh, slide of mine. Uh, you have a, um, a, a robotic uh, surgeon uh, on the top left corner. You have a, a robotic surgeon who's doing um, doing doing uh, surgery on a patient. Uh, you have the king of all things, which is the which is not necessarily a Samsung phone, which is on the, on this uh, on this picture, but uh, the mobile phone, the smartphone. Uh, you have under that the uh, it's a GPS uh, on the top right corner and the, on the uh, bottom left corner are two shots of the International Space Station and uh, bottom right corner is a uh, is a CT scan uh, film. Now all of these are the products of one thing and that one thing is imagination. My submission to you is that that's one thing which is the root cause of practically every invention, not practically every invention that human being has ever made is the first thing that is destroyed in our schooling system. Let me look at a uh, very briefly and broad overview at artificial intelligence. AI is probably the most bandied about um, name or word uh, or phrase in our, in our society today. <clears throat> what is AI? What's artificial intelligence? Number one is machine learning. As I mentioned, machine learning will um, will replace human beings in every kind of repetitive work. Take IBM Watson. IBM Watson gives legal advice in seconds compared to however much however, however much time you, uh, an advocate or an attorney would use, and the accuracy is ninety percent. Uh, compared to 70-60% of an attorney for a simple reason that the machine can analyze data, the machine can um, mine data, the machine can research data much, much, much faster than a human being can. IBM Watson, the medical application of that diagnoses cancer four times more accurately than a doctor. Uh, Self-driving cars and trucks, uh, we have been talking about this they are already on the road. They are working. They are working on them. They are getting progressively better, as all of this stuff tends to do. Just to give you a, a quick picture, we like to talk about how self-driving trucks, and uh, usually we use U.S. data because uh, that's where perhaps it's uh, most visible. Uh, self-driving trucks, how they will replace truck drivers. You know, my, one of my dreams, and I, I, I'm hoping that uh, some driver of a of a massive 16 wheeler is watching this um, please invite me to come and, and sit with you in your truck and go for a ride on one of your on, on one of your long hauls uh, that's my dream to ride in a 16 wheeler cab uh, on a long on a long drive i have the i have absolutely phenomenal admiration for people who drive long haul trucks uh, they drive an extremely sophisticated machine and the, the expertise with, 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 with which they drive that is absolutely mind-blowing. I've seen some of these guys parking in, uh, in, in uh, motels. Uh, with one finger, he parks, parallel parks a 16-wheeler and puts it between two cars uh, with more aplomb and with more finesse and with more style uh, than I could do with a bicycle. I mean, that's how uh, expert they are in their job. But take that driver out of a 16-wheeler and give him any other job, for the most part, he will fail. Not because he's stupid, but because he's highly specialized in one area. It's like a cardiologist. Take an absolutely fabulous, supreme cardiologist who can do a bypass surgery in his sleep. Take him and put him into a 16-wheeler cab and he is dead. Not because he's stupid, but because this is a different world. Now... But what are we saying when we are saying automated trucks? What do we normally hear? We say automated trucks means no drivers, which means no coffee halts, uh, no lunch halts, 
no halts to uh, what I call equalizing the body fluids, uh, no, no need for sleep, uh, no problem of, uh, of drowsiness, so therefore no accidents, we'll have sensors all over uh, and so on and so on and so on. Therefore no stoppages, the truck starts from New York, drives all the way to San Francisco without a stop and then the truck drives all the way back. And you might say, well, what about gas? Well, what about gas? Just build a big, big enough gas tank and you don't even need to stop for gas. Now, who does it benefit? It benefits, number one, the transport company because turnaround time is uh, reduced to practically nothing. Uh, so number of trips is more, they make more profits. Who does it also benefit? It, it benefits the people who are transporting the stuff because now they are saving on driver salaries, they are saving on accidents and so on and so forth and the product gets to the market fast. Who does it also affect? It affects at least 5 million truck drivers in the United States alone. Now 5 million is a big number and it's not just 5 million, multiply that by 5 because we are talking about their spouses, we are talking about their children We are and then factor into it their home mortgages, factor into it their children's school fees, factor into it their health insurance, factor into it all the human aspects of it. You are talking about 25 million people minimum being affected when trucks go automatic, um, who will be out of jobs, uh, who will be struggling for a living. Here you have a person, a man or a woman driving the 16-wheeler who is able to live a comfortable, honorable life with their family on the street. That is the human cost of automation. Factor into this also with the automated trucks, also automated taxis. Already we have them. What happens to the millions of taxi drivers? And remember, I'm talking about only one country, which is the United States. This is going to happen worldwide. This is going to happen worldwide. Now, what is going to happen to all of those people? It's very simple and easy. Our financial analysts and our technologists will say, well, retrain them. Let me tell you, I'm a trainer. I've been training people for the last 35 years of my life. I have trained over 200,000 people. Ask me how easy it is to retrain a middle-aged truck driver or a taxi driver to do some other job which will earn them an equal amount of money. And I will tell you, the chances of doing that are zilch, zero. So we are talking about an entire generation going into the ground because of automation. But believe me, no matter how many tears you want to shed about this, this is going to happen. That is the meaning of technology. Now, I'm not only looking at, you might say, well, like, this is a doomsday view of technology. No, this is a realistic view of technology because obviously the other side of technology that it will be uh, fewer accidents and faster transportation and lower cost and so on is also good. Alhamdulillah. I'm not talking about, I'm not against that. But I'm saying that what about the human aspect of technology? Give it some thought. Now, what are the, how is technology affecting us? What are the global changes in technology? Technology will result in robotic manufacture. As I told you, anything that can be automated, will be automated, is being automated as we speak. This is happening. Automation of agriculture, for example. Now you might say, well, how do you automate agriculture uh, or how much can you automate agriculture? Let me just give you one example. I have a friend of mine in, in England uh, who, uh, who has about 3,000 acres of land. Uh, she has uh, her husband uh, who passed away. He was a, a country squire. So they live in a beautiful manor house uh, in uh, just outside of London. Um, about 3,000 acres of land, a farmland. Uh, she has two employees, two. And one of them is really a, an employee who substitutes for the one person who actually runs the farm. That is how much you can automate agriculture as we speak now. 3,000 acres of land run by one person because this friend of mine, she is an elderly uh, lady. She is not running farms. She is not, you know, driving tractors and so on. One guy. 
uh, completely automated. Uh, I, I know people in, uh, in, in South Africa, for example, uh, with uh, cattle farms, uh, with large-scale agriculture, everything automated. They run, if, if you're flying over South Africa, also all over Europe, for example, uh, when you're flying, you will, you, will, you will fly over land which has huge round disks. Those disks are the disks created by the automated uh, uh, the irrigation systems uh, that are there because the irrigator moves like that in a, in a circle and the amount of water, the amount of nutrients and all of that is regulated from a control panel somewhere uh, by one person many times by by a computer and it all happens automatically that's how much you can you can automate uh, agriculture uh, automating housework we all know about that most of us have all kinds of gadgets in our homes that's how it's been automated what has happened is uh, just like agriculture took away jobs from farm workers automated housework took away jobs from house workers Automated, automated manufacture, we know all about that. Petri dish meat. Meat will not be grown on farms. Meat will be grown in laboratories. And believe me, it won't be cows and sheep. It will be insects. Insect protein is one of the uh, fastest to grow and one um, has, the, has the fastest or, or the most profitable uh, food to meat ratio. And, and guess which is the most likely insect to use cockroaches so welcome to uh, a cockroach hamburger now think about all that will need to change including how we think thanks to all this and take automation of medicine for example I, I already mentioned to you IBM Watson in terms of diagnosis think about this a machine that works a device that works with your phone uh, it takes a retina scan to uh, to, uh, to identify you, uh, takes a blood sample, you breathe into it, and then it analyzes 54 biomarkers that will identify any disease that you have. So you can sit at home and just use this machine. Uh, blood sample is simple, like, like people who are diabetics who do it every single day. They know how easy it is. Uh, retina scan, and you breathe into that, and this then gives you and diagnosis for you any disease that you might have and I'm saying 54 because that's the number they have right now it can increase to any number how many of you have seen a gecko a lizard a siplak a chipkali uh, what happens if you try to grab it you try to grab it you hold on to the tail and you are left with the tail in your hand because it leaves its tail behind it automatically cuts off its tail that's how it escapes uh, so you have this tail which uh, also it has some movement in it, so you are hanging on to the tail, and the actual lizard is gone. Now, watch that lizard. Over the next few weeks, it will have a new tail. It grew its own tail. That is what advanced stem, uh, stem cell technology uh, is going to do, which will allow you to replace your organs. So, you grow a new liver, you will grow a new pancreas, you will grow a new spleen, you will grow a new, a new prostate, you will grow your, maybe you will grow a new eye. You blind in one eye or both eyes and you will grow new eyes. Maybe you lost a finger in an accident, you grow back your finger. Sounds weird, but that is what stem cell technology is, uh, one of the things that it is supposed to do for you. And as I told you, lizards are doing it already. So it's nothing so new. Um, they say that life expectancy will go from, go to, 115 years, 125 years. Uh, I am from Hyderabad and uh, our grandmothers had this uh, dua which they used to give us. Today when they say this, we tell them, please don't give this dua, it's not a good dua. But they used to give this dua and they used to say, Allah tumar ko sawa sawa saal ki umar deo. And they used to say, may Allah give you a lifespan of 125 years. Uh, so I think maybe these grandmothers, they knew something about <coughs> where science is going uh, because that's what they're saying now that with uh, new stem cell technology and life expectancy will be 125 years. I am not talking about life expectancy, I am talking about life quality, I am talking about how will those 125 years or whatever number of years will um, will pass because these, and I, as I mentioned I am not even doing some uh, you know, uh, exhaustive listing of how technology will affect us, just some broad broad uh, uh, flags 
on what technology can do for us. And that's why I'm saying uh, the question we need to ask, linking it back to education is, does our education prepare us for this new world? Does it do it? Does it not do it? And if it is not doing that, or at least not doing it adequately, what is it that we need to do to change education where it will help us to deal with this new world? I want to. I want you to look at the second uh, link of these Nigerian teenagers. Now look at them. Here is a bunch of teenagers who are from Kaduna. I have been to Kaduna several times in Nigeria. Um, they are working with a smashed cell phone, and they are making sci-fi videos. They are making these fantastic videos. Uh, eventually, they, they managed to get some funding to get some proper computers and so on. They are working in a very uh, low-tech environment. They are working with bad equipment. They are working with very slow internet connections, but they are making fantastic videos. We are not talking about children who have gone to uh, filmmaking academies and schools. We are talking about these poor kids in Kaduna in Nigeria who have taught themselves to make sci-fi videos which are good enough now to attract the attention of the audience on a global plane. So this is what technology can do. This is what makes teachers redundant. So click on that uh, on the second link in the uh, description and watch this video. So what must we empower immediately? What must education do? We need to empower <clears throat> the first thing that we need to empower is integrity because integrity will help us to empower the rest of it which is imagination innovation creativity and so on and so forth uh, we need to empower kindness we need to have, and again as i mentioned again it is not just about brownie points kindness because if we are kind if you are compassionate it opens uh, views for us it opens areas for us to apply technology to help people and therefore to develop that technology and to sell that technology which helps us also in earning a uh, in earning a living, uh, to empower risk taking, freedom, all of this begins with integrity, and integrity begins with no plagiar plagiarism. It's it's amazing the amount of um, copyright material which is stolen and used, and people have no sense of shame. It happens to me all the time. People take my stuff and they use it for their presentations and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I, I'm well enough known. Uh, for other people who watch it immediately to come back to me and say, you know, I just saw this presentation, somebody is using your stuff. Now, I mean, okay, so uh, we say imitation and uh, um, plagiarism or, uh, you know, stealing copyright is perhaps the uh, most sincere form of praise, but I would rather not do, uh, I would rather do without that f uh, sincere form of praise. So integrity is number one important. Uh, second thing is, we come back to this issue of changing our method of testing that must focus on understanding an application and not only on random access memory for data. Random access memory for data is utterly useless. We need to focus on understanding of something and on the application of something. And that's the, right, that's the reason why uh, we need to change and we need to, re to relearn. Otherwise, we teachers face the risk of redundancy. Today we have what I call skewed tech think, um, which basically talks about maximizing margins and maximizing shareholder wealth. Nothing wrong with that. But if you look at it exclusively without the human cost, then we are headed for a very nasty place. Because maximizing margins and maximizing shareholder wealth consists of two things, which is maximizing productivity, which means automation. And second one is minimize cost of production. One of the major cost of productions is the human cost. And that is seen as a cost to be eliminated. Now, my question is, how do we eliminate human beings in any situation? Um, let me give you uh, the, the example that I gave or I have given many times before, of automated trucks. When you put 5 million truck drivers, and I'm talking only about United States figures, when you put 5 million truck drivers out of jobs, you are affecting on an average 25 million people, given 5 people to a family. You're not only talking here about those people and, their, and the effect on them of this inflicted poverty of being out of a job, 
uh, which means being unable to pay bills, mortgages, health insurance and school fees and so on. But you're also talking about that many fewer consumers in the market for these services and products that the market provides. It is five million, it is 25 million consumers less for Walmart, for Best Buy, uh, for anything, all kinds of services and products in the market, it is 25 million people less. And that's one country we are talking about this change coming globally. This cute tech thinking, uh, which treats uh, human cost as something to be eliminated uh, is skewed. I mean, for in, in that sense, it is something which is obviously faulty because uh, if you are taking human beings as a cost to be eliminated, uh, then at the same time, you are eliminating that many consumers. You are eliminating that many buyers. Uh, how does that work? On the one hand, you want to maximize <coughs> shareholder productivity and shareholder wealth. On the other hand, you are minimizing the number of consumers. How does this work? Uh, this doesn't seem to occur to, uh, to most people. And that's why Andy McAfee in his book, The Second Machine Age, he says people will rise up before robots do. Uh, what that means in terms of global peace, harmony, law and order, uh, what that means in terms of security, uh, what that means in terms of crime, all of this is open to the imagination. I encourage you to imagine that because that is the hidden cost of technology that we seem to ignore. And that's why my question is, all of this stuff looks sexy and nice, but who pays? Somebody, believe me, somebody pays. And who's that somebody? That somebody is you and it's me. The essence of all of this, the essence of technology uh, globally, and of course, all of this applies to technology in education, which we are talking about, uh, is briefly the most immediate one is faster and easier access to information. Any kind of information, all of us are used to doing that, to Googling stuff on, the, on our phones uh, and so on and so forth. So faster and easier access to information, uh, hugely enhanced information storages, uh, today, the cloud is everywhere, uh, fast searches, enhanced computation power. That's how, um, for example, IBM Watson works. Uh, potential, therefore, from this um, information storage as well as computation, the potential to forecast scenarios, uh, prepare for eventualities, outcomes, how to leverage that, how to get the maximum benefit from it. How to, pre how to protect us ourselves from potential threats because of all this. And finally, and most importantly, especially for those in positions of power, how to control, to influence, to track, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, for surveillance, uh, security, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that even in... Um, in bad times, uh, in the last recession, for example, one of the facts that came to came to light was that while um, almost every single manufacturing and service com service company uh, showed a loss, the only services companies which showed a huge gain were the surveillance and security companies. Now, I think that that speaks uh, for itself. So, uh, technology, therefore, is there. It's there to stay. Uh, it's not going to go away. Uh, we can we can ignore it, but uh, we will not be safe from its effects. Uh, not all effects are negative. Of course, the hugely positive effects of technology and therefore technology is something to be embraced. But while embracing technology, we have to understand the implications of that technology. Uh, not everything is positive and not everything is negative. Now, how will all this affect us and how will what will change? Number one, of course, positive thing, uh, huge conveniences in all areas, cheap services. Today, for example, take Uber, take Amazon Prime, take Netflix, uh, take, for example, uh, air travel, all the bookings, everything we do on our, on our mobile phones, uh, take mobile phones themselves, take the smartphone itself, uh, and so on and so forth. So all sorts of 
conveniences uh, gps for example today getting lost is is you can get lost if you want to get lost uh, there is no need to get lost uh, so it's uh, something that is uh, and of course everything becomes cheaper i mean if you look at the prices for example or just of computers what they were in uh, 10 years ago what they are today hugely cheaper for a far superior machine so huge huge conveniences on the other hand loss of jobs loss of jobs for all generalists in all areas anything which can be automated will be automated anything anyone who is doing something which a machine can do will lose that job because the machine will replace you this is already happening and this will continue to happen one of the uh, early examples of this was the automation of the flight reservation systems which were used uh, in uh, travel companies for example in travel companies uh, the travel consultant was a prima donna uh, because he or she used to Uh, give you an a uh, travel itinerary uh, in a period of about 24 hours the fastest of them could do that overnight uh, and they give you and they gave you about maybe two alternate uh, itineraries today uh, thanks to amadeus thanks to galileo uh, the different uh, the flight uh, um, reservation systems when they came uh, into being and i'm not i'm talking about amadeus and uh, and and uh, galileo came uh, became current in the early 90s uh, from the early 90s onwards uh, the same prima donna travel agent was became redundant uh, because anyone wet behind the ears could sit in front of a machine uh, using galileo or amadeus and give you multiple travel itineraries in a period of 3 minutes i'm not talking about 24 hours i'm talking about 3 minutes in the in the space of a telephone call they would give you multiple itineraries that's how technology changed um so therefore current education is redundant already i remember reading a survey somewhere which said that uh engineering information changes every 3 years which means that somebody who is in a 5 year uh engineering course uh in year 3 what he he or she learned in year 1 is already history now therefore what we teach must change and how we teach must also change we need to empower imagination i keep on saying this over and over again we need to empower imagination currently we are used to killing imagination so we need to empower imagination curiosity self learning the job of teachers is to open doors and show them what is available tools are there self learning is something uh, which is happening and which must be encouraged my concept of schooling is something that happens in the night uh, what do i mean by that i mean in the daytime the students will do their own study their own learning and so on uh, in their homes wherever they are and in the night in the evening they will come to the university they will come to the class for the teacher to value add to what they learned on their own i think that is what self learning is about the teacher must be able to value add to what they can learn on their own the job of the teacher is not to teach them what they could, they could have learned on their own on uh, a computer or by any other means what a teachers are needed for is for ethics and values to demonstrate that to teach them interpersonal skills because machines cannot teach that to teach them decision making because machines cannot teach that they can give you tools but how to actually evaluate and take a decision teach them responsibility accountability citizenship teach them friendship all of these things are things that we need to empower and which where teachers are needed parents are needed in the role of teachers uh, because machines can't do that anything a machine can do believe me a machine can do better than you will ever do it and a machine can do it for free whereas we at the end of the day we need to be paid we need to uh, we need to live and work as human beings not as machines now what will change in teaching itself there's both a danger and an opportunity Uh, the first and foremost thing to understand is that knowledge is freely accessible take khan academy for example any course you want go to khan academy you can learn the course for the most for the most part it's free um, go to take uh, mit take harvard take sloan uh, go to the major universities of the world they have put practically all their knowledge uh on open source uh platforms where you can go and actually take a course in any subject of your choice 
free of cost sitting in your own home country in your own home uh, you may you will not get a degree from mit for that but it doesn't matter you have got the knowledge and you can apply the knowledge you don't have to do that so this is uh, has removed not just lowered but removed all entry barriers as far as acquisition of knowledge or access accessibility to knowledge is concerned um therefore what can teachers and what should teachers do why do we need teachers to value add to what students can learn on their own which means that we have to up our own game we have to do our own research we have to do our own reading the question i ask a lot of teachers is how much of original reading do you do what kind of um attestation courses uh, what kind of courses do you attend to enhance your own understanding of things uh what accreditations do you take ongoing as part of your own personal learning now if you are not doing all of this stuff then the question to ask is how do you think you can add value to students because students what we are teaching students to students can learn on their own and actually they can learn them much better because they are learning it in their own environment their comfort level is better uh, they don't have to pay for it it's for free and accessing of that information a student can access on his or her own far more information than any teacher can hope to teach in a particular class so we have to up our own game to say how can i add value to what the student can learn on their own um testing methods i say this over and over again we have to change the way we test we have to focus on application not on memory alone memory only in terms of how to apply what they have learned memory as in regurgitating undigested information if you do that with food it's called vomit uh, it's as as useful as that so therefore changing of testing methods is absolutely critical um and finally and most importantly become role models role models for ethics and values earn respect respect cannot be demanded uh, earn respect our role as teachers is not to give answers but to ask questions ask the right questions ask challenging questions which will force the students to delve into areas they haven't thought about before which will force them to delve deeper into into things that they have they would not have done on their own that is the value add of the teacher your value as a teacher depends on the questions you ask not on the answers that you can give now how to teach that most of us are used to teaching subjects so we teach history and geography and math and science and so on and so forth we teach subjects we teach them as discrete subjects we don't even think about in a given day if a student starts in the morning at 9 o'clock uh, with a with a subject the period is for english literature and then the next period is for mathematics and the third period is for biology and the fourth period is for botany and the fifth period is for history and the sixth period at the end of the day is for geography we don't even think about how these six periods are linked to each other how they affect each other how they can help and leverage help the students to leverage the knowledge that he or she got from one period into another period. we don't even think about that it's not part of our game we don't we don't even consider that this is possible but it is entirely possible it is entirely doable and this is how we will make education we will we will enable education to make sense to students and the way to do that is to teach through projects people are holistic knowledge is holistic to dissect it and divided into little bits and pieces which are to be uh, dealt with individually this is a, a crime that we have committed i think we have to uh, to repent on this and to get back to teaching holistically and the way to do that is through projects let me give you an example take the project now why projects because projects are uh, the beautiful way to teach they encourage participation from the students uh, how do you do that you take a topic and then you teach multiple subjects with that topic as the base now um your job as a teacher uh, is to ask the right questions now in a project class you will have students of multiple ages you will have multiple teachers because the questions that need to be asked uh, have to be asked by people who are experts in different disciplines so you will have the content expert 
uh, of different uh, disciplines simultaneously teaching a group of students in the same class and that class is uh, will have students of multiple ages different ages uh, why that because that's how human beings learn human beings do not learn in age specific groups uh, the date of manufacture over here has no importance uh, your date of birth has no value what has value is your ability to learn and your ability to think and that spans dates of birth we learn from each other we learn from our elders so a 5 year old child we learn from an 8 year old child we learn from a 16 year old child uh, all that the teachers need to do is to be there one to ensure um, hygiene and safety and second secondly is to ask the right questions let me give you an example very quickly uh, which is take the pro take a project saying oceans now you have this project saying let's learn about oceans what do we learn about oceans for example in oceans we study biology which is marine plants and animals uh, how uh, oxygen is created um, how uh, the algae uh, of the ocean how they produce oxygen uh, and so on and so forth so you have uh, the issue of biology in oceans you look at also physics of oceans which takes us into uh, float uh, into ships uh, into ship construction which also links up back to with with uh, biology and with botany which is if you look at the sailing ships which enable uh, enabled the for example the british empire to become a global empire was because of their ability to create the great clipper ships which crossed big oceans they crossed the atlantic they crossed the pacific um, and that was because they had oak trees in england so the secret of the british empire or is is not in politics it is in botany which is the oak tree which enabled them to create the great clipper ships and which the rest of it follows and then out of that came the politics and out of that came uh, the colonial history uh, of the british empire which made it the uh, the the largest empire uh, in the world of the time then we have take chemistry for example a oh, simple question why is sea water salty why is river water what why is fresh water not salty uh, tides for example the effect of the moon on the tides uh, how is that how does that help us what does it do uh, glaciers uh, when they melt what happens uh, rise in uh, sea levels what will what does it mean uh, wave energy alternate source of energy uh, one of the most powerful ones uh, which is to date unused or Um, not used enough is wave energy uh, desalination uh, of sea water to uh, to help us uh, when we are running out of fresh water uh, trade now the the, the oceans uh, for millions of years the oceans were barriers uh, between between cultures uh, between countries then the ocean thanks to sailing ships and this became long before the british empire the, the, the first people uh, known to be great sailors were the polynesians Uh, who who were the islanders in in the pacific ocean uh, and then came many other people there were the chinese there were uh, great chinese mariners uh, there were the great arab mariners and then much later came the europeans the uh, primarily the british the uh, spanish and the portuguese uh, who became great sailors and who crossed the oceans and so on um, which resulted in new trade routes it resulted in goods from one part of the world to come to another part of the world um, cultural changes population changes um, the politics of it uh, some of it good most of it evil uh, enslavement of population all of this but the, the, the i'm not talking about the you know the good and bad i'm talking about what enabled all that to happen uh, was the oceans and the same oceans which were until before until the, all of this happened they were barriers uh, take the jo take geography for example the same oceans as a project you are teaching geography uh, you are teaching navigation orienteering finding direction using the stars finding direction using the sun taking sextant readings uh, using of the chronograph and so on so forth sailing itself uh, ship design uh, ship building the industry of ship building uh, the movement from uh, wooden ships to uh, and sailing ships uh, to powered ships uh, the great cruisers today uh, the great tankers today uh, the great cruise ships for example i mean i uh, i went on the um, on the alaskan cruise in the uh, inner channel uh, on a ship which was uh, which was 15 stories high 
you know it was a, I mean, just to look at the ship it was, it was like a huge massive ship uh, 15 stories high uh, i think if i if i'm not mistaken it was uh, 200000 tons displacement of this uh, of this ship a uh, beautiful absolutely fabulous cruise liner uh, it, I, that ship of that magnitude floats on water i mean to look, to look at that and going therefore uh, we, we today we talk about floating cities cruise ships are floating cities uh, if you look at all that you can do on a cruise ship you can do every single you can do anything you can do on land on a cruise ship and so there are floating cities we already have floating cities uh, history the maritime history of nations how the history of nations changed uh, for example how the british empire uh, forced china uh, to continue the opium trade because it helped the british economy and it destroyed an entire generation in china that was of no consequence how did that happen because of ships because of the british ability uh, to bomb china at will to enforce the chinese emperor to continue to produce and sell opium now is a very <clears throat> uh, poignant comment the other day which i saw um, the current uh, uh, protests that are happening in hong kong um, i'm not going into the moral aspect of it what is right and what is wrong i'm just talking only about the comment comment uh, some one of the uh, western um, mainstream tv journalists he asked the representative of the time of the chinese government uh, about a comment made by uh, a british mp Uh, who said that china must understand that if they force their way into hong kong uh, the consequences will not be good the when this question was asked to the chinese uh, representative of the chinese government uh, it was quite it was quite funny in a way because he laughed and he said uh, this is not the same china they should understand that this is not the same china and that is believe me that is true it is not the same china <clears throat> this is a very different china so i think this is uh, these are things that uh, you know we uh, need to keep in mind uh, where we look at so when we are teaching with projects uh, we are looking at uh, teaching in a way uh, where we are teaching multiple subjects using one project which is in this case oceans uh, use it with anything else use it with uh, take mountains for example take deserts uh take climate climate change whatever you want to do uh, teach through projects in conclusion i want to say that success is where opportunity meets preparedness uh prepared no, not preparation preparedness uh preparedness means to be ready for the opportunity at the time it emerges not preparing for it when it emerges now given all that i have mentioned about technology given all the opportunities of leveraging that technology in our education the question i want to ask you is do you think you are prepared for that and if not what do you think you need to do so to begin i suggest to think about what are the say three things that you need to do in order to get prepared personally as well as for whichever institution that you work as a teacher for the institution to get ready to leverage the technology that is available for us today to use in the best possible way to empower our students to become successful in their lives thank you very much for watching um do let us have your comments and thoughts we will be very happy to um to listen to them and if you have any questions uh, my website as well as my email is uh, on the screen please take a look at that and i'll be very happy to answer your questions Thank you very much once again.